And I still remember some patients, like they were coming breathless and tired and just fed up looking. And then I see them, so, you know, it's three months, six months and 12 months. And I, and I see the change. They run in, they've got all this energy, they're happier. And it's so satisfying to actually change their life. They're doing things they haven't done for a long time, you know, like back in their 20s and 30s, you know. So weight loss, medications and surgery remain a very hot topic, sometimes controversial. And today I'd like to look back on a conversation that I had with my dear friend, Dr. Simon Ghosh, who's a bariatric and weight loss surgeon, is very proficient, not only as a surgeon, but an excellent communicator. And as I listened back to this episode, I realized there were so many nuggets and so much gold in terms of the do's and don'ts of weight loss medication, uh, weight loss journeys, and of course, what you might expect and who might consider having weight loss surgery. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. And if you know someone who's considering losing weight or who's considering surgery, I think this one's going to be really helpful. So let's get into it. Obviously, you and I have been friends and colleagues for, I think, about eight years. Um, But for everyone listening to the podcast, um, obviously, you didn't originate in Australia or even on the Central Coast. So tell us a little bit about how you've ended up as a bariatric surgeon on the Central Coast. Yes. Yeah, so look, I was born in a in a small town called Merthyr Tydfil in South Wales, which is near the heads of the valleys near Brecon Beacons. Um, and look, uh, if people know Wales, there, there wasn't much happening in the 70s and 80s there. And, and the thing I wanted to do was just think, like, let's explore the rest of the world. Where can we go other than Wales? So I was trying to get out of there as quick as I can. And I thought London was the next best place. So I ended up going to London and spent around 12 years in London. I completed a degree in biochemistry and physiology at King's College London. Um, and then I did my medical degree at University College London. So, and that finished around 2002. And, and then I was considering staying in, in London to do surgical training. But I thought, no, I need to explore another country. Let's go to Australia. So we all got a few, myself and friends went to Australia in 2003. And then I had to start again, basically. So I started my surgical training again in Australia, actually at Gosford Hospital, and did around sort of like 10, 10 years of extra training post-grad. And I did a fellowship in 2015 in general surgery at Gosford. And then it, it got to the point where I had to decide what was going to be my specialty. And I was looking around all the different specialties like breast, colorectal, cancer surgery. And I thought, well, look, I'm really interested in the obesity epidemic that's, that's occurring now. You know, there are a lot of overweight people there, a lot of people suffering from obesity. And I started seeing the results from certain surgeons performing operations which are now obsolete, such as the gastric band, but seeing the difference in their lives. So I thought, right, I need to do a fellowship another fellowship in bariatric surgery. So I then went to the Royal Brisbane Hospital in Queensland and I, I did a fellowship under a surgeon called George Hopkins and we worked in a high volume centre. We completed lots of primary and revisional bariatric surgery, including the sleeve and the bypass. And, and then I settled then on the Central Coast and started my practice there. And actually, Shauna, you were my first referral um, around, I got back from my fellowship and it was around four months after I finished my fellowship that I got my first bariatric referral. And you, you referred the patient to me and, and I believe she's still doing well and she's happy. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how it all started. Yeah, she is. She looks absolutely amazing. And so for anyone listening who doesn't know the term bariatric surgery, can you just explain what it is we're actually talking about? Sure. So bariatric surgery is, is an, another term for weight loss surgery. Now, it's not just weight loss, it's improving your quality of life. Um, so there's different types of procedures that allow you to do that. So obviously, before you go into the procedures, you, many people are familiar with the fad diets. and You can try all the diets and you exercise to try to lose weight. But it's very hard to sustain and maintain that weight loss with just diet and exercise. Um, so a more sort of radical approach is surgery. Now, initially, it used to be the gastric band back in the late 90s and then sort of in the late in, in the early 2000s, the sleeve came in. So the, the sleeve gastrectomy um, is the most common sort of bariatric procedure where um, it is require it requires laparoscopic surgery, 
which takes around about an hour. And what, what the actual effect is, is to, to remove around 80 to 90% of the stomach. So your, your stomach is around about this wide in, in real life. And you, so the size of your hand? Size of your hand, and then and you move it to the size of my two fingers. You remove that, and this is your remaining sleeve. So and it's removed the, surgically with keyhole surgery. Keyhole surgery. And you literally then pull out the bit that you've cut off through the yep. little hole in the tummy, and it's thrown it's in the set. bin, yep. never to be reattached. That's, That's exactly right. And you make a good point there because it is irreversible surgery. But the way, the way that the sleeve works is that... Um, when the original stomach is there, there are lots of hung, uh, there are hunger hormones. One of them is called ghrelin, which gives you that appetite, that hunger. So when you have removed the large portion of stomach, you have less ghrelin receptors, and you 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 lose your appetite basically. And and to combine with that, when you do start eating, because your stomach is very small, uh, it's a thin, narrow tube. Your portion sizes are a lot smaller, so so you you end up having less calories. Um, so. The thing with this type of surgery, the sleeve, which is the, the most straightforward uh, operation, it, it is just a tool to allow you to, to lose a substantial amount of weight. Okay. So if someone was coming to see you for a consultation to dis- discuss that, is there certain criteria um, of patient that you think is, is a good candidate versus someone that you think is definitely not a candidate for this kind of surgery? Yeah. So look, the, there were initial criteria... Um, documented back in 90, what, 91, I think they were. And look, the criteria we use is the BMI index or the body mass index, which is your weight over your height squared. Now, uh, this is just an, a, a, a quite a familiar sort of formula that most surgeons or practitioners use. And look, your normal BMI is around between 20 to 24. Um, now, in the consensus before, in the 90s, the consensus was that if your BMI is over 35 and you have a comorbidity, you would be eligible for surgery. If your BMI is 40 and over without any comorbidities, you are eligible for surgery and so on and so forth. And the higher the BMI, the, the higher risk obviously and the more, more likely you will need to have the surgery. So that, so that is the rough criteria, but then there's, there's absolute contra, contraindications of surgery. For example, so the, the general age group is around between sort of 18 to 65. Um, most patients must have tried and exhausted all the different types of weight loss um, materials, such as diets, some of the, the medications you can that are out in the market now, exercise, and they've tried um, other methods of losing weight. Um, there, there has to make we have to make sure that there's no history of alcohol or drug issues or uncontrolled mental health disorders. So they're the criteria where you, you really have to be careful on deciding to operate on those patients, and then. Yeah, so like, I mean, if they haven't got any of those, then most candidates with a BMI over 35 are a candidate for surgery. Although around in America, the UK now, they're dropping that BMI down to 35 without a comorbidity or even BMI 30 to 35 with diabetes because people are saying, what are we waiting for? Yeah, we're waiting. Why are we waiting for the, yes. the condition? So just to clarify with everyone, we mean by comorbidity, things like hypertension, diabetes, etc. So yes. something else that's going to cause you a health problem along with your weight problem. Yes, that's exactly right. And so clearly this is not a, something that you're going to do if you're, you know, you've got five kilos to lose, no matter how stubborn those five kilos are you're not going to go and have this type of surgery. No, I agree. And I think that's very important. Um, I do see a lot of patients who are sort of the, the lower BMI scale who, you know, I take a thorough history to find out how they've got to that stage. And, and everyone has a very similar story. Um, but you're right. I mean, if it's five kilos you need to lose, you know, I think surgery is very radical. It's a radical approach. But I think, you know, if your BMI is sort of 45, 50, then I think surgery will definitely help you and allows you to have that tool and it orders you for you to change that mindset into getting good habits back in place. Yeah. I think the thing that's very interesting is there's no doubt the vast majority of patients have have shocked me. I can even remember one of the first patients I had who had surgery with you and she came in to see me 
about three days after her surgery and she opened the door and my first comment was oh did you get cancelled because she just looked so amazing I couldn't believe that she could have actually just been up walking around so I think um there's no doubt that people bounce back from the surgery extremely well yes. but the uh, the flip side is that there are obviously people who can have a pretty troublesome time and and people really need to be aware of that don't they yeah I think yeah that's very right um so look even though it is straightforward surgery, and we've just talked about the sleeve so far, it is, you know, it takes about an hour to do the, op- 45 minutes to an hour to do the operation. Most people go home the next day, they're up walking about, they're at, they start, they see the dietician, they, um, and they, and they, they feel fine. But then it's not an easy journey. Now, when I talk to a lot of patients, you know, the first six to six weeks to three months is tough because for, it's not about just eating three meals a day. You know, you then, you know, I have dietitians that work with me, and there's a specific diet that you should be maintaining. It's pretty much a high-protein diet, like 50% in protein in every meal. And most people are eating around five to six meals a day. So it's different to the old three meals a day. And so people feel quite tired and lethargic, even though they've lost, say, a lot of weight, say 20 kilos or so in the first, say, three months, they still feel a little bit tired. Um, and they haven't got the energy they have until things have started balancing out. So by sort of 12 months, people sort of look back and go, I'm so glad I did it. That was great. I feel good now. They're exercising. They're doing things they haven't done for a long time. Yeah, I think for me, the real thing is the confidence. Um, You realize that actually this person has really had such a loss of confidence for years and years and seeing people who know I feel comfortable to go to the gym or go and buy new clothes or in fact going on holiday and things that they clearly haven't done for years but I think we do live in quite a sort of fat shaming society don't we really yes it's true I mean I I I do see that and in the stories and you see it too I mean the patients come in they say look I have to go I can't buy clothes from a normal shop I can't even do my shoelaces up or I struggle to get up off the floor, even getting out of my car, um, even just running after the kids, all these little things that you take for granted. Um, it's just a very common complaint from everybody. And then, and then after, like you said, afterwards, you know, six months down the track, they're now in their active gear and they're in the gym and they're, they're actually enjoying what they do. They are spending more time with their kids. They're doing things they haven't done for a long time. So, and that's why I say to patients, it's not about the actual amount of weight don't get obsessed on the amount of weight you lose. It's, let's just let's get obsessed with the, all the, the holistic things that are going to change in your life. Your blood pressure is disappearing. You're, you're off your CPAP machine. Um, your diabetes is resolved. Um, you are now doing 5K walks without being out of breath. All these little things that, that improve your quality of life. Absolutely. I remember this patient telling me a story of how she would walk around Coles or Woolies. And, and she actually genuinely did our daughters have five children and she would but always feel that people were judging her about the amount of food that was in her trolley yes. and she said she would be nearly having sort of conversation stroke arguments in her head you know with people kind of wanting to say I've got five kids like don't judge me and she always felt that she was being judged yes. for how much food was in her trolley and that people thought that she was sort of fat and lazy and I think you know there is just a lot of shame heaped on people yes. who have a weight issue and I think you and I I know have have chatted about this over the years that you know I think you know the uptake in surgery and the success of the recent um, injections that people lose, yes. used to lose weight I think the thing that that really proves to me is that we're not injecting these people with willpower or yes. when you remove a bit of their stomach you're not giving them willpower and actually these people never lacked willpower in the first place but yet they've probably been always judged all of us mm. doctors particularly are probably have been guilty of that always telling people we'll just eat a little bit less and just exercise a little bit more but but clearly weight and obesity is so much more complicated than that and and at the end of the day, you know, these people have been made to feel quite ashamed. Yes. And I think the other thing that I think is quite interesting is that we also live in a society that, you know, there's just food everywhere. Yes. Um, and it's so much cheaper to buy unhealthy food. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it, it's an addiction potentially that is so easy to feed um, because there is literally unhealthy choices cheaply everywhere. It's much easier to afford. But I, I agree with what you said. I mean, people's, people, I think, 
people lose their confidence and they, they they feel embarrassed about going out. They feel embarrassed about going to the gym. They they are they feel like they're being judged on what the types of food they're having. And then and a lot of I do a lot. You would see a lot of this as well. I imagine that some people have sort of binge eating disorders or comfort eating disorders. They're depressed. They're unhappy. So they stay at home and they they're not going to cook a nice nutritional nutritional meal. They will just go for the easy foods, which are high in calories. And then it's a it's a vicious cycle. You know the weight gets further, they start be developing comorbidities, their mental health deteriorates. And it, so it, it is a very hard one to manage. And I think the one thing I, when I, when you see patients in, in your rooms and they, uh, they, they'll say, it took a lot to come and see you to talk about having surgery because there is a stigma attached. And I, it seems to be less and less now, but there's still a stigma. You know, a lot of patients say to me, oh, my friends think I'm cheating by having surgery. I know, isn't it unbelievable? And do you not think, I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but there's clearly been some pretty high profile celebrities. That's correct. Actors, pop stars who have lost a dramatic amount yes. of weight. And wouldn't it be so good if they would come out and probably admit that they've had the surgery yeah. and destigmatize it a little bit? Mm instead of saying that they've just decided to become really healthy. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly believe some of those stories. I think yeah. that they've definitely had help. And great, like, Look, I, no I problem. Agree. I think yep. brilliant. But it would be so nice if someone was brave enough to actually say yeah. so that all the people who've had surgery or using weight loss injections didn't have to feel bad about it. Yes, no, I agree. I mean, it. yeah, I mean, coming out like, yeah, a big celebrity talking about their journey would, just be like a great thing but it's i mean it's not that easy i mean everyone wants to keep their journey private but but i think i think now i just see more and more people who you look around a lot of people have had surgery and they're quite open about it they'll talk about it and they'll they'll advocate it because they think it's the best thing they've done and like you said even with the injections i i do agree with some of the pharmacotherapy um for those patients that are not too obese that just need to lose a little bit of weight i think it's great and i'm happy happy to prescribe these medications to help people lose that weight to change that mindset but the whole thing with whether it's diet injections or surgery um you know you may lose all that weight in the first 12 months but the the whole thing is is keeping that weight off and and maintaining that new mindset that that new you that you're gonna you, you're gonna start exercising start enjoying life being more active start doing more things and and, and not creeping back into bad habits and that's why i think follow-up you know, with GPs, myself, dietitians is very important, and even psychologists, um, because I think it's very easy to fall off that bandwagon, especially later on down the track, two, three years, you, you gain a bit of appetite back, you start going for the wrong foods, you start becoming a bit lazy, and then you start creeping up. So I think it's important that we, so we're accountable, you know, as practitioners. And so what is kind of happening there? I mean, is it a case of the actual, if you think of the stomach as being literally a, a bit of a bag that holds food, is the bag stretching over time or what, what's going on there? Because I definitely have seen a few patients where we're getting a little bit of weight creep where they, you know, maybe lost sort of 20, 30, even 40 kilos, but we're seeing a drift upwards, not a big drift, but certainly that sort of four to five, six kilo mark is starting to creep up a little bit. It, do you yeah. know what the mechanism is? Um, look, it, it's. I think it's very complex. Um, I wish I had an answer for it. Look, I think it's a combination of behavioral and surgical factors. I think if you go for the behavioral sort of uh, aspect, I think that during the first 12 months when the weight is rapidly coming off, um, they're seeing a transformation, physical transformation themselves, that they will look different, they'll feel different, they feel lighter, they're looking at numbers, uh, whether it's protein intake, whether it's their weight, and they... They, they, they have something to measure and they feel great. And then they get down to a weight where they stabilize, right? So, so your BMI sort of becomes, say, normal and you stabilize. And then the surgery has stopped doing its job. I mean, it's taking you down to that plateau weight, right, which is around 12 months. And then after that, it is entirely up to you. It's what you decide, what your choices, you know, you make. To, you know, going forward. Going forward, yeah. So, you know, if you choose a quick high carb meal or a, what they call slider food that will just digest very quickly, then the the ongoing increase in those slider foods will increase your weight steadily. Okay, so things, I'm going to stop you. What's a slider food? Slider I haven't food, heard that. Slider food is generally something that's easy to digest, something okay. like crisps, oh, okay. um, crackers, 
um, things that sort of melt in your mouth. So the digestion occurs, something high in in High glycemic index, so you just get a big sugar spike as well. Sugar spike. Things digest quickly. They start digesting in your mouth. Whereas meals which are high in protein, they can't digest in your mouth. They, They will take time through the GI tract to digest. So they take longer and they keep you fuller for longer. Now, the other causes of back to the weight gain is that sort of choosing the wrong foods is one, right? Mental health decline. So people, a lot of patients, as you know, would have had previous mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, PTSD, binge eating disorders. So that could creep back in life. You know, we, we're we not used to the curveballs can be thrown at us all the time and we don't know how that's going to go. So mental health could decline, which can then t- resort you back to eating the wrong foods. Um, major life events, trauma, divorce, death, these sort of things, um, and other things, sort of alcohols. A lot of people then start consuming more alcohol because it is easier to have a sip of an alcoholic drink than to eat food. And again, alcohol is liquid calories. Yeah. When I started this podcast back in December 23, I knew that I was lucky enough to have amazing conversations with various health professionals across all facets of medicine and allied health and I knew that you would probably really enjoy being a fly on the wall to hear what we talked about and that's how the podcast was born and what you probably don't know is that this is a bit of a passion project we don't have any sponsors or funding and without your help we won't be able to continue bringing you these great guests so if you can please spread the word about the podcast Share it with someone who you think might benefit from the conversation that you've just listened to. Or if you can leave us a review or a comment, it would mean the absolute world because that actually helps the podcast spread further and get more people to hear our message and hopefully allow us to invite bigger and bigger guests onto the show. And I would so appreciate you helping me back. Thank you. I mean, I think you and I both sing off the same hymn sheet and that we're both very into that multidisciplinary team mm-hmm. where I find sometimes patients fall off and um, or perhaps are not receiving what where I think they should be in terms of care is that um, definitely some people don't provide that dietetic support or the psychology support. And I absolutely mm-hmm. love that you provide that very um, thorough uh aftercare program for your patients and I think for a lot of patients I'm always trying to tell them like the surgery is only one step that's exactly right and um, and this is this is a lifelong journey and um, one of the other things I find is that and um, the patients don't want to buy the expensive multivitamins can you explain yeah. why you need to take those higher dose vitamins yeah look so um they yeah, obviously the generic vitamins but look when you say you've had a bypass or a sleeve um particularly the sleeve and the bypass for its malabsorption, which we'll talk about later, but you are removing a lot of stomach in the sleeve. So you're actually removing parietal cell mass, which is the, the cells that produce acid, and you're, and you're also reducing something called intrinsic factor, uh, which is responsible for, for B12 absorption. And your hydrochloric acid is also responsible for iron absorption. So the, the two... Um, big nutrients that sort of decline are B12 and iron, both in the gastric sleeve and the bypass. And look, the multivitamins do contain B12 and and iron, but I definitely still see patients still requiring supplemental iron infusions or tablets and B12 injections down the track. Because it doesn't matter how much you're eating, you're not absorbing it. Um, And then especially in the female population, along with menorrhagia or sort of heavy periods, um, lack of meat in the diet, they have then an increased chance of lowering their iron. And then other things, um, a lot of patients have a low vitamin D when I can, when they see me or they see you. And obviously vitamin D is responsible for calcium absorption for healthy bones. Um, so vitamin D declines, so that's an, an additive in the multivitamin. And then you've got trace elements such as copper and selenium, which can decline over time, mainly in the bypass. Um, so it is important to make sure that you are taking them regularly because you physically cannot absorb a lot of them. So yeah. and so there is sort of specific multivitamins that are geared towards people who've had this surgery and they presumably have 150% or something yes. of the recommended dose. So they've got higher High quantities. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So I do, that's one of the things I feel like patients kind of get to the point where they kind of nearly forget they've had the surgery. They're living yeah. their life and then suddenly, you know, something happens, maybe 
hair starts to yes. really thin or they start yeah. to have teeth and gum problems. Yes. Um, are there any other issues that you yeah, see look, people with? Look, I definitely see that with, with all patients. In the first sort of five to six months after surgery, I definitely find that the hair becomes thinner. Definitely losing, not clumps of hair, but it becomes thinner. And I find their nails become a bit thinner as well. And sometimes their gum health can decline. I think this is a combination. This is not very well explained in the literature, but I think it is a combination of lack of protein. And I think even though most patients are taking protein throughout their um, journey, I mean, people, everyone experiences, experiences it. And some people buy special products for their hair, for their nails, um, just to try to improve the improve that or dec- uh, decrease the amount that they're losing. So if someone was coming to you out or if they have a family member or friend who's coming to you to discuss surgery, what might the sort of pre-operative period look like? I mean, do you ask your patients to, you know, go on some shakes to lose weight or do you ask them to lose a certain amount of weight before the surgery or do you have sort of any kind of pre-requirements that you're looking for? Yeah, so first of all, you know, after seeing the patients, um, after getting a full history and examination, look, I would do a set of bloods just to make sure there's no prior deficiencies prior to surgery. Um, make sure they're fit for surgery, that there's no other sort of things like cardiac issues or respiratory issues. And then say they're all good to go for surgery and they, they've made their mind, they decide they want to do it, that there is a preoperative diet that everyone really must do. Um, now, generally, it is a ketogenic diet. And it is a shake diet, which involves around sort of the, the basic uh, approach is three shakes a day with two cups of salads or vegetables, 100 grams of protein, and there's a muesli bar as well. Now, most people require this for around two weeks. And the reason for this is that it's not about starting the process of losing weight. It is about reducing the size of the liver. So as you said before, this is laparoscopic surgery, um, but generally... In, in reality, the liver sits on top of the stomach. So in surgery, you have to lift the liver up. Now, if someone has a sort of a fatty liver, which many people do, um, then the ketogenic diet will break down the fats in the liver and shrink the liver by around 10 to 15%. So the liver's smaller, it's easier to retract, there's more intra-abdominal space, more chance that you'll do safer surgery, less chance of the complications, and, and, and a nicer shaped sleeve or a bypass because the liver is smaller. So it, 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 it's, it's mainly for a surgical, um, makes the surgery safer and easier. So it's not really about prove to me that you can that's, eat less. That's right. It's not, it's right. Okay, that's really. But, but the one thing that, you, that I should say is that some patients who are super morbidly obese um, may need to lose quite a lot of weight beforehand because obviously the very elevated BMIs can be surgically difficult to operate on. Right, so okay. that some people do need the help of medications, the, the injections, the Optifast, um, exercise physiology, general exercise and decreased portions and pre-optive dietitian before with it they have surgery. So like a multidisciplinary approach. Yeah. And so the weight loss injections are something that you might prescribe to your patients to help them on the journey? Yes. Look, I, I, look I'm, I'm a real advocate for these injections um, because... The, the, and they all work differently. Like there's the older ones such as fentamine, uh, which are not used very much anymore due to the side effects. But the newer ones, the GLP agonists or the glucon-like re- uh, uh, receptor agonists, um, they are they seem to be doing, um, you know, allowing a lot, five to ten percent of total body weight loss um, prior to surgery or after surgery, and they're obviously reducing the appetite. And I find it good either pre-op or for patients that say they're four or five years post sleeve or bypass. They're getting into the bad habits again. So they try to re-engage with the dietitian. Their portion sizes have increased a bit. They need another tool to help them, to yeah. get them back into to where they are. And I, I, th- I think um, that the injections are, are great for this, and I'm, I happily prescribe them. Yeah, I have to say I agree. I'm, I'm a, a real um, fan of them in the, in obviously in the right patient. Yes. But I think you know we just need to remove a lot of the stigma. We need to be a lot more compassionate, and and I, I do find it frustrating. That, you know, obviously we can talk about drug names per se, but clearly most people know what's gone on in Australia and worldwide with a lot of these weight loss medications. And, you know, ultimately people who were overweight were kind of made to feel bad that they were 
ultimately, you know, stealing medication from diabetic patients and yes. things as well. And I feel like it's so unhelpful. It's already potentially a patient who's already full of shame and, and lacking in confidence. And to be made to feel guilty, I personally think that, you know, um, their health problem is just as significant and they're they're very likely to end up as a type 2 diabetic anyway yes that's right that's exactly so the irony is like are we just going to wait till they become diabetic then you know and then they can have it without feeling guilty so there's there's definitely that um i know i've had quite a number of patients who've had the surgery um a lot of them with you and and a few with some other surgeons but I, i have to say those patients i i love them i remember them all I remember their stories and just seeing the confidence so it must be a great job is it and that's why I love it I mean it is I I actually look forward to the list to see who's coming back you know three months or six months I I wonder how she is now you know and I still remember some patients like they were coming breathless and tired and just fed up looking and then you know and then I and then I, I remember that time when I first saw them and then I see them so you know it's three months, six months, and 12 months, and I, and I see the change. They run in, they've got all this energy, they're happier, you know, and, and, and it's so satisfying because, they, you know, to actually change their life, you know, they're, they get, they're doing things they haven't done for a long time, you know, like back in their 20s and 30s, you know, and it, it, it is very satisfying. Absolutely. I can think of two patients. I have one who has been my patient since I've arrived in Australia and she used to just constantly see me with knee pain and we did everything with her knees and we scanned them and x-rayed them and she had laparoscopic procedures in her knees and also arthroscopies and the reality is that it was the weight as soon as she got the weight she she always laughs to me with me now and she said do you remember I saw you for like three and a half years <laughs> with my and of course we we probably knew that it was a weight thing but we didn't we know to the extent right. that it was affecting her and you know it's just brilliant because she just can walk everywhere she's become this little fitness person yeah. which is so so lovely and I have another patient who had never been in either the sea or the pool with her children because yeah. she was so self-conscious so she only let her husband they always took um the kids in the pool and took the kids to nippers and I remember her coming in and showing me so happily the pictures of not only her at Nippers with her kids, but that she was now a volunteer yeah. and uh, was like running a little age group at Nippers. And it's just, it's so transformational for people. So I think that people should have a lot more of an open mind about it. I think they need to keep in mind, it's not an easy thing to do. No. There is always the potential for complications, but yeah. I think I'd love to see family members being a little bit more supportive yeah. um, and friends and, and not teasing people for cheating, as you say. Yeah, I think that's important. And back to your story, I still remember a patient uh, recently, actually I did the um, the Bay to Bay run, the, the uh, 10K run, and I saw one of my post-op patients and she was there. She goes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the whole marathon. I went, gee, you can do the whole marathon, the half marathon, the 22K, and she completed it and she sent me all these pictures of her completing it and it was so nice too, like, you know, she hadn't run for 20 years, but she said, this is going to be my goal now, I'm going to get back running again. And that just made me so happy. And I saw her there at the time and I thought, this is great, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of unusual in a surgical specialty that you get to follow your patients right. up for so long. Yeah. Um, as you know, I started off training to be a surgeon and then I swapped because, well, for many reasons, but one of the reasons I found it quite frustrating because I always wanted to know what happened to the person. Um, and that's why I think general practice suits me because I kind of like to know what goes on with the story. But because you're really proactive at seeing your patients for quite a long time, yes. you get to tag along for the journey as well, which yeah. is pretty nice. Yeah, it's really good. And then especially with the, a lot of patients, they like to get into social media and they like to show their journey. And which is, you know, I, I love to see the journeys on social media, but it's, it's good for other people to see their journeys as well, to see how they, you know, a lot of people, you know, going to find it hard to sort of have the courage to, to, you know, to make the decision to have surgery. But then if you see someone's journey who's had surgery, you know, they've seen the ups and downs of surgery, that like what it's really like to have surgery. It's not all going to be easy for everybody. You're going to have some tough times, some good times. But generally, you know, at the end of the day, you fast forward 12 months after surgery, most people are happy. And I think, but I think the social media is, is good for that sort of thing. I mean, I think people relate to stories more than anything, Definitely. don't they? They can see that person themselves in yes. that person which is which is really helpful so I suppose the other elephant in the room in Australia is that unfortunately this surgery is not easily accessible to everyone so particularly people who live in remote and 
uh, regional areas sometimes don't have great access to surgery and then there's also that financial thing so I suppose this is a bit I get a bit confused about is this surgery actually available under Medicare in the public health system yeah so look in Australia um, there there is there are limited numbers so in certain hospitals in Sydney um, there are definitely um, surgeons that will operate in public hospitals on patients that need surgery but from what I understand there's a, a specific criteria um, so first of all, the BMI may need to be quite high, sort of 50 or 55, 60, where there's multiple comorbidities. Secondly, patients may need to have a certain BI with um, type 2 diabetes. Um, and the other criteria is, so, so you have to fit that BMI criteria and, and comorbidity criteria, but the other criteria is that you have to then follow up with the surgeon and the dietitian and a psychologist, and I think this is a very planned, um, a planned, planned event in certain public hospitals in Sydney, where they will have a, a dedicated dietitian and a psychologist um, and a bariatric um, a general practitioner to make sure that they're they're completing their um, their goals along their way, because the average waiting time is around about twelve to to fifteen or sixteen months, and so, so unfortunately there is a big queue through Medicare. Like, right. You know, there's a there's a big sort of bottleneck. Um, now, for people that so basically can't get it through Medicare, the only option is in the private hospital. And there's two ways of doing that. And unfortunately, like it is quite expensive surgery. Um, no doubt about it. I mean, so some people can access their superannuation for it because it's a chronic disease. Some people can pay privately for it. What but, about if you have private health insurance? Does that help you? It helps you a little bit, um, but there's still a, a large uh, gap. gap that you have to pay. And I, and this is mainly because this is not just the operation itself that takes one hour. This is all about the preoptive dietitian follow-up, the preoptive appointment with myself or another surgeon, um, the post-operative dietitian appointments, which occur for around 12 months. Um, psychology can be, um, can be involved in some cases. I selectively use psychologist. Um, the assistant, um, the um, anaesthetist, um, and all the, the nursing staff and the disposables for the operation. So it does end up being quite a lot of money. But and you're paying for theatre time and hospital bed yes, and all that yes, kind of stuff. Okay. Yes. So, okay. And do you think that that's going to change, Simon? Or well, do look, you think? I'm, I'm hoping it is. Look, I know that in the UK, um, I talk to family members, they are doing bariatric surgery in the NHS. As we know, we, we both grew up in the NHS and you know, it is a great, um, you know, idea. There's, they have specific criteria. Uh, the waiting list is not as long. Um, you're eligible with certain BMI and comorbidities. But in Australia, that it's just very hard to sort of get all these patients in when we still have cancer surgeries to do, which are obviously more important, uh, you know, more critical to be done before sort of bariatric surgery. Um, and there's still a lot of colonoscopies and gastroscopies and skin lesions that need to be done and your emergency surgeries like cesarean sections and appendicectomies. So it is the funding in the public hospital and the, the, the politics involved in deciding, you know, who can get which surgery when. I mean, maybe there's a bit of unconscious bias or conscious bias that, you know, some people actually believe that it's not a priority and that they think people just need to eat less and exercise well, more, which we've talked about. We don't agree with, but yeah, and 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 as we both know, is that if you can resolve hypertension and you you offer blood pressure medications and you can resolve diabetes and you're not on a CPAP machine, you're not getting multiple prescriptions, you're in and out of hospital less, so you're going to be less of a burden on the public system. So it's a no-brainer to do uh, public bariatric surgery. Yeah, I agree. And so, just back to the surgery, I. I do you know that some patients who've got bad gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn can sometimes have to have a slightly different procedure? Is that right? Yes, that's right. So like what I say to patients that patients with pre-existing reflux, volume reflux, um, that are on a lot of medications such as Somac or Pantoprazole, you know, the antacid medications, that um, then a sleeve may not be the right operation because... Right. A sleeve, like I said, is a narrow tube, which is high pressure um, and can worsen reflux. And I say, you know, at least 5% will, will get reflux after a sleeve. So what I do talk to patients about is the actual original gastric bypass, which is called the Rouen Y gastric bypass. So this is a much more complex operation. It's been around since the, the 60s, and it's more common in America than it is Australia, um, I would say. But 
Um, this, the difference here is that we're not removing any specimens. Right? So we, with the sleeve, we're removing the specimen, like you said, we're throwing it in the bin, it's gone. Whereas a bypass, we are actually dividing the stomach and making a, a small gastric pouch of about 50 mils. And then we're bypassing around about um, two meters of valve. So one meter with it, which is in your alimentary limb, which is um, your food channel. And then you have a, a BP limb, which, or your biliary pancreatic limb, which is your enzyme channel. And the way, the way that bypass surgery works is that obviously you have restriction in the amount you can eat because of the small gastric patch. But the, the caveat with the bypass is that you have the malabsorption effect. So the enzymes that are traveling from your pancreas down into your bowel, which normally break down carbohydrates and lipids, are not in contact with the food. So by the time they, they reach the food channel, they've broken down, they're, they're, they're inactive. So people will then excrete, will get rid of the carbohydrates and the fats. So it's a restriction and a malabsorptive procedure. So does that mean they get lots of diarrhea and things? They can. So, so because you may have more bile, which is alone in the channel, um, without food. So you can get things like a bit more loose stool. I find that with bypass surgery, people may have variable bowel habits, maybe sometimes constipation, sometimes diarrhea. Um, and look, the difference between the, the two procedures, like you probably wouldn't know the difference long term, but I think a bypass is slightly more durable than a sleeve. So, I, and I think that if you're looking at weight numbers, um, I think that a bypass may lose, say, around 35 to 40% of total body weight as compared to a sleeve. But at the risk of being a, a more complex procedure, it takes around two hours to do a bypass, especially a real Y. Um, but uh, th there is another modification of the, the real, which you, you, we've talked about before, called the mini gastric bypass, or the one anastomosis gastric bypass. So this is a, a, a simpler bypass where you bring one loop of bowel up to a long gastric pouch bypassing around 200 centimeters. Now this is less risky than the real Y, but it, it may still not be good for reflux. So there are other, other options, um, but and each person, like like you said, has to be um, discussed, you know, discussed in detail about which procedure is right for them. Is there anything that you would love the general public to understand a little bit more or differently about what you do in the surgery that you have? Because it's it's very, it does become, it's very common surgery. I think a lot of people, say when I compared to some eight years ago, a lot of people do know about the surgery already. Um, so they've done a lot of their own research. A lot of them said, I've been on Google, I've been onto people's websites, I know all about the surgery. And we in particular, uh, we send them videos about bariatric surgery and obesity and we give them some t to see prior to seeing me. So I think that's a good way of doing it. I also give handouts from the Royal College of Surgeons about bariatric surgery, which um, gives them an idea of it. But a lot of this is already, they, they know about it. And mainly because my friend had a sleeve, my friend had a gastric bypass. So they all seem to know about the procedure and they even know about things like reflux. Yes. It's, it's amazing how much the population know, which is good. And then when I see them, I can then say, well, yeah, you're right about this. And I, I agree, this is the right operation for you. But or we disagree and we agree together what the right operation is. You know, some people don't want 80% of their stomach removed because, you know, you have got no stomach then. Whereas if a bypass is slightly, it is higher risk, but you still got, you can still put it back together if you had to. And presumably, technically, the bypass would take a lot longer than 50 minutes, though. No? Yeah, I think, I think the, the, the bypass, the single bypass takes about an hour and a half and, and the, the real wide takes about two hours. Um, okay. And then you've got the you've got another cohort of patients so we've talked about primary surgery which is the sleeve and the bypass and then you've got people undergoing revisional surgery which again is is more complicated so people who've had a gastric band in the past yes and that was really like literally a big rubber band yes. around their stomach to make it smaller is yeah, that back right back in the in the 80s it used to be a silicone plastic band which which had no port but the new gastric bands had a uh, an expandable and contractible band around the stomach, which you can access via the port on the stomach to make it bigger or smaller. But there seem to be a lot of sort of uh, effect, side effects and people not tolerating it. It was only when I came to Australia that I really saw that. I have to say that wasn't something I saw a lot of in Northern Ireland, yes. to be honest. It, I didn't see it much in the UK. So, okay, the patient has had their surgery. It's all gone well. They've lost, what's the kind of percentage body weight 
that you kind of see people lose, Simon? Well, look, it, it, it depends on their starting weight, but on average around 30 to 40% of their total body weight. Wow, it's amazing. And presumably they're losing fat, but also some muscle. Yes. So we need to be encouraging them to do strength training. And I know a lot of my patients have got into a lot of that kind of strength and weight stuff, which I absolutely love because lots of them are perimenopausal and postmenopausal. So yes. that's really helpful too. Um, what else, what do they look like at that year mark? Yeah, look, I mean, I, I do see a range of, range of patients. So say patients in their 20s with a sort of little BMI of 30, 35, they seem to lose um, the weight. And, and I think the younger patients, I don't know whether you, have, you probably have more experience than I do, but they seem to have more elasticity and they have less loose skin in the younger age group. But as you get older, sort of people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, um, they can lose the same or even less amount of weight, but have a lot more redundant skin. Not so much so that needs to be to have an operation, but just loose skin that sort of is just a little bit. And they do complain about it. Um, there's that. And some, look, some people do develop hypertrophic scars from the laparoscopic port sites also. So hypertrophic scars, just explain what that means. So, look, so when the incision's closed, it's closed with a, um, uh, an absorbable suture. Um, and even it's even though it's a linear cut and closed in a linear fashion, some people that the the actual scar raises and becomes a little bit sort of a keloid, a little bit keloid, uh, red and lumpy. Right. And you know, usually most wounds heal by three months, but I do see people down the track and they may have like a history of keloid or hypertrophic scarring where they they they're really happy, but they want to get rid of their scars and you know so that you can I do see those proportion of patients. I think you're right. Literally in the last week, I saw a patient at my Newcastle clinic and she was in her late, no, sorry, late 20s. She had actually lost the most weight I'd ever heard. She'd lost 55 kilos. I, oh. I'd never seen someone lose that much weight. But actually her skin elasticity was actually amazing. Like on her face, she, she, she certainly had some laxity and that was something that we we're going to work on. But it was nothing like I would see in the patients who are maybe yes. more in their 40s and 50s. Yes. Where I, I definitely think that, you know, obviously if someone's lost such a substantial amount of weight, you get all these changes within the fat pads in the face. Right. Um, and, you know, we definitely see people at our clinic where we, you know, use a little bit of filler and skin tightening and things just to give a tighten. So there are, there are possible ways of getting Yeah, definitely. I mean, some people definitely do need to potentially go and have plastic surgery if it bothers them you know they will go skin. and have excess skin removed from their arms or yes. their tummy but some people are just one they just do not want to have any more yeah. surgery and um, you're not going to get the same results as if you have surgery but you can definitely there are definitely non-surgical things that we That's can great. help with yeah. so where do you see the future going for weight loss surgery do you think there's going to be new techniques i hear i've had a patient um, have some type of balloon inserted into her mm. stomach to to reduce her uh, um, food intake. Mm. I mean, where do you think things are going to go? What's so, next? Look, I think the the big game changer is the pharmacotherapy, like the injectable drugs. I think I, you know, I'm I'm actually looking forward to this because there are some drugs which are you know which are now still not TJ approved as we've discussed, but some of the injectables are providing good weight loss already, even though they're for diabetics. But I think in the future, I think at the beginning of next year, some of these companies are going to turn them into more higher dosing drugs, uh, which are going to have a more profound effect on appetite um, and hopefully at a cost effective price. So I think the, in the injectables are definitely the, the future. I think for certain categories of patients, so that the lower BMIs, people with, with not so many comorbidities, um, I think the, the procedure you talked about, the two procedures, the gastric balloon and the endoscopic sleeve, look, I have seen gastro, gastroenterologists perform these procedures, but I have seen a lot of patients come back and I do a gastroscopy and I find that there's not much change. And I, I just don't, even though they're less invasive, you're not making incisions to the abdomen, I just don't think they're a durable um, way forward. That's weird. Um, that's my personal opinion. Not, not everyone may agree with me and I think surg the actual surgery is more definite. definite. Um, okay. So I'm going to quickly flick and I'm going to ask you, we ask all of our guests this question. If you could tell your 20 something self something, it, what would it be? 
Um, look, I think it, when you're in your 20s, you, you think you know everything. And I think I thought I knew everything. But I think if I look back now, I think you need to have a goal in life. I think you need to set yourself a goal in your 20s and plan where you're going to be in 20 years' time or 40 years' time. Just have a plan. I think the other thing is that I've learned is not that I've changed my behavior, but I think just be nice to everybody. Uh, you know, treat people how you want to be treated. Show respect, show empathy. Um, just be kind. Um, it doesn't matter who you're dealing with, what they do, um, what their job is, how old they are. Just be nice to everybody because I think being nice to everybody will allow you to develop relationships with people. And, and the one thing, the other thing I've realized now is that you can't do things solo. You, you cannot do things on your own and manage. You need family, you need your teamwork, you need, a, you need your, your team, you need friends and colleagues to help you because there's always ups and downs in life. And I think, I think that, that, that's what I'd sort of say to myself. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing I will say is one of the reasons that I do refer my patients to you a lot is I, I absolutely love how you are with your patients and with our joint mm -hmm. patients. And they always feed back to me about how down to earth you are, how good you are at telling them all the good things that might happen, but also what might go wrong, but that you always treat people really compassionately. So I think that you actually have done that and I, I suspect you were probably like that in your 20s anyways so Simon if anyone wants to know more about this type of surgery or how they could support a friend or family member um about having this surgery or how they get in contact with you can you tell us how they can find you yeah they look they can find me on a, on the website um my website is uh, www.cosurgery.com.au um, there's a phone number on there on the website with videos and information on surgery. Um, we also have an Instagram page called Co-Surgery and a Facebook page called Co-Surgery. Um, I pretty much consult at Erina, Tumbiumbi and Canwell. And my main operating place is Gosford Private Hospital. But you definitely have people who come interstate to see you, don't you? Yeah, there, there, there are a few. Um, I've had a few recently from Bathurst and Orange. Um, I think and I've had a few people from Newcastle. I mean, it's, uh, and and again, that's, you know, I do see patients say, well, there are surgeons up there that do this operation. They say, oh, no, but we, you, you operate on my friend or my sister. And it's nice to have that connection. Um, but yeah, that's true. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. That's very kind. And thanks for uh, inviting me on the podcast. It's very exciting. It's my first podcast. So I really appreciate it. This podcast and any information, advice, opinions, or statements within it do not constitute medical, healthcare, or other professional advice. Information is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. If you have any health concerns, always consult your doctor.